Markham. I'm E.G. Marshall. Has it ever occurred to you that success breeds its own failure? We've all heard of actors so successful in one role, they are never offered anything else. This also happened to a famous writer, the creator of the first great fictional detective, Sherlock Holmes. Our story today is not written by Conan Doyle, but is about him and those unmanageable days when he refused to compose one more Holmes adventure and a mysterious mirror that so mesmerized him that he had to. Louise, I want you to look straight into that mirror and tell me what you see. I see my own face. What else is there? You don't see any shadows moving across the glass. What kind of shadows? Something in the shape of a cross. No. More like a dagger. Oh, Arthur. You're not seeing that again. Our mystery drama... The Silver Mirror was written especially for the Mystery Theater by James Agate, Jr. and stars Gordon Gould. I shall return shortly with Act One. Interestingly enough, nothing of this extraordinary tale derives from any of the published works of Arthur Conan Doyle but is contained in diaries and letters kept in the British Museum. Originally, Doyle studied medicine and became a successful doctor. He gave that up in order to become a writer. Now at the age of 40, he is sick and tired of turning out his popular Sherlock Holmes adventures, and so he is giving that up. I'm a free man, Louise. I can write what I please without that cursed detective jumping out at me from every page. You mean that's the last Holmes story you're going to write? That's wicked. I had to do it, Louise. Either Holmes had to die or I would. Oh, don't be silly, Arthur. It's only a creation of your mind. Dearest wife, you don't understand. To me, Holmes is as alive as anyone I know. And I simply don't wish to see any more of this. I hereby dissolve our friendship. I don't understand you at all, Arthur. If you'd had years of failure, well, that might be a reason to try writing something different. But you've had years of success. Twenty-four Holmes' adventures are twenty-three too many. I'm not saying I'll never write of them again. Perhaps someday I will revive him. But what's Peter going to say? He's not going to like it. But I like it, Louise. Well, my girl, you see before you a happy and liberated man. <laughs> now, Arthur Conan Doyle may at last turn his thoughts to writing about other people. <laughs> A month ago, Peter. But I don't think it's turned out the way he wanted. Why do you say that, Louise? He's miserable. He's depressed. He says he can't find any subject to write about, and he stalks about this house like a caged animal. Hmm. Where is he now? Up in his study. I'll go see him. Oh, no, I, d I don't think he wants to see you, Peter. Besides, he goes to bed early, he sleeps badly, wakes up early. Hmm. Did he know I was coming over this evening? Yes. And he said he couldn't see you. He wasn't feeling well, you know, all that. Not see me? I've been his publisher for, oh, I don't know how many years. Why wouldn't he want to see me? Peter, I was ashamed. I mean, that's what I think is the bottom of all this. I don't understand you. But when he wrote that last Sherlock Holmes story, in which he had Holmes plunge over the cliff to his mm -hmm. death, mm -hmm. Arthur said that was it. He simply wouldn't, he couldn't write any more of those. Yes, we talked about it. I told him it was writer's block. And calls where they had it, toast or Zola. He'll get over it. Yes, but for this long? Uh, you're sure he won't see me, Louise? Uh, we're old friends. Well, let's see what kind of a night he has. And if he wakes up in a good mood, I'll give you a call and you'll come over, all right? Mm. Let's keep your fingers crossed for tomorrow morning. Someone were attacking you. Oh. It's the same nightmare, isn't it? Yes. Yes, it always is. They were after me. It was frightening. I was rooted on the spot. I couldn't get away. 
I can never get away. It's only a dream. But so real. The way my feet wouldn't move. Was it only a dream? Every time I say to myself, is it a dream or a warning? Arthur, I won't have you talk such nonsense. A warning? <laughs> You're just going through a bad time. That's all it is. It was suspended in the air following me. Just like last night and two nights before that. What does it mean? Why is it? The dagger? Yes. You're... You're overwrought. Oh, darling, just be sensible. You haven't killed anybody. But I have. I killed off Sherlock Holmes. Oh, why must you go on like this? You're a professional writer. You created Holmes and Watson and Moriarty, and they're made-up characters. They never lived. So nobody has died. I'm not so sure. If they have life to thousands of readers, haven't they lived? I think that's carrying things a little far. I really do. I mean, here you are, one of the first people in London to have a telephone installed. And you dream of daggers and let it upset you. Arthur, I want you to go and see Dr. Sinclair tomorrow and talk to him about it. I have no intention of seeing George because I have nightmares. All right. Suit yourself. Now turn over and go back to sleep. Well, who do you suppose that is at this hour of the morning? I hate being interrupted when I'm having breakfast. Oh, just go on eating, darling. I'll just go see who's at the front door. Yeah. Peter Matson, Arthur. Arthur, I don't usually visit my writers this early, but I happen to be passing by, so I thought I'd drop in. You two sweet people must think I'm an awful idiot. Louise telephoned you this morning, didn't she? Uh, Louise telephoned me? She got you up at the crack of dawn and she said, Peter, I'm worried about Arthur. Sit down, Peter. Hmm. May I pour you some coffee? Yes. I did call Peter this morning, and mm -hmm. yes, I am concerned about you. You don't look too well, Arthur. You've been uh, burning the midnight oil? I've been having peculiar dreams in the last few weeks. They wake me up, and then I don't get back to sleep. I wish you could see yourself. I never look in the mirror. Haven't since I was a child. Couldn't bear the shock. You look gray in the face. It's not becoming. I'm going to leave you two now. I have lots to do. Peter, would you stay for lunch? Arthur and I are going out. Oh, we are? Uh, look at the sun up there. This is the first decent weather London has had in weeks. And you and I are going out to enjoy it. How far does this tram take us, Peter? We go to the end of the line. Are we heading for the thieves' market? I haven't been there in years. Mm -hmm, neither have I. I always enjoy watching people buy back what's been stolen from them. Oh. <laughs> uh, been having a rough time since you stopped Holmes' adventure stories? It's no secret. And I don't know if it's my subconscious making me feel guilty or what. But Peter, I'm determined not to get back into that rut. I was getting awfully stale. Now, now to your readers. No, I'm not exaggerating, but we're getting mail by the sackful, demanding more of your Holmes and Watson stories. No, stop. All out. Please, Marky. All out. Well, enjoying yourself, Arthur? Not a fact, I am. I can go up and down these booths and stalls out here in the open all day. Are you looking for anything in particular, Peter? No, not really. I always find something in an outdoor fair, flea market, and get it home. It doesn't look so good, and I shove it into a closet. <laughs> Isn't that a handsome mirror over there? And what a strange frame. Let's take a look. Hmm. Seems quite old. The frame could stand repair. <laughs> Considerable cleaning. What's extraordinary is how clear the glass is. See here, on the back, a metal ring. That's what it could have hung from. I wonder if the frame is really silver or just some white metal. It's hard to tell it's so grubby and black. My guess is it's a few hundred years old. As you say, it probably hung somewhere in some old castle. 
The carving on the front of the frame intrigues me. Oh, I wish I knew about those things. I say, are you the owner of this stall? I am that, sir. Uh, this mirror, uh, what are you asking for it? Twenty pounds. Oh, it's in very poor shape, you know that? I'll give you fifteen. Eighteen and it's yours. Uh, seventeen. So. There you are. Fifteen, sixteen, seventeen. Uh, uh, you needn't wrap it. We'll take it as it is. Thank you, sir. I can see you know how to buy here. Uh... <laughs> I always idle, even if I don't want the piece. It's my nature. Arthur, accept this old mirror as a gift for me. Peter, what a nice idea. I want you to put it on your writing table and look into it. When you see your face getting as gray as it was this morning, you can do one of two things. Get out for a quick walk into the fresh air, or write yourself another Sherlock Holmes adventure. Either way... I think you look and feel better. Louise? Louise, will you come here a minute? I want you to see something. What is it, dear? Oh, doesn't that mirror look nice? How did you get the frame to shine so? I used some coarse salt and wood ash and a great deal of gentle rubbing. Well, it's taken every bit of tarnish off. It's certainly not the same old filthy thing you brought home the other day. What did Peter say? I haven't spoken to him. You're the first to see it. But that isn't why I called you in here. Louise, I'm propping this up against these fat books. I want you to look straight into the mirror and tell me everything you see. Please, sit in my chair. Now, what am I supposed to look for? Darling, don't look for anything. Just... Look. Well, what do you want me to say? You don't see anything yet? Well, yes, of course I see something. <sighs> I see my own face. You don't see any shadows moving across the glass? Shadows? No. No shadows? Something in the shape of a cross? No. More like a dagger? Arthur, not again. What are you talking about? You're not seeing a dagger in daylight, are you? In this mirror? You don't see anything? I have simply no patience with you when you're like this, Arthur. The mirror is not bewitched. You are bewitched. So far as I'm concerned, I want nothing to do with this stupid mirror. I just refuse to give in to spooks and all that folderol you subscribe to. I'm not asking you to, Louise. I happen to believe there is untapped psychic phenomena that is trying to communicate with us, and you don't. And I don't have to. Oh, Arthur, can't you be as objective about yourself as you are about everything around you? Do you think... Oh, I don't know how to say this. I... I'll say it for you. You're asking me if I'm not having hallucinations. Suppose I asked George Sinclair to come here for dinner. It wouldn't be the same thing as a visit to a doctor's office. It's just a, a personal and a friendly thing. All right. Have George here for dinner, and we'll see what he has to say. Dr. Conan Doyle once said, never shut your mind to the unusual or the unaccountable. How often have I said that when you have eliminated the impossible, whatever remains, however improbable, must be the truth. How close he is to the mark, I hope we shall learn when I return shortly with Act Two. great novelist decided to kill off fiction's most popular detective, Sherlock Holmes. He wrote a story in which Holmes reads a farewell note and dies. That was to be the end. And just when Conan Doyle thought he was free of writing detective fiction, he began to be haunted by dreams and visions in an antique silver mirror. Is it, is it always in the same dagger, Arthur? Or, or do you visualize a different daggers? Louise, I told you George would make light of it. Oh, no, no, no. no. I'm doing no such thing. <laughs> as your doctor, I'm trying to find out whether this dagger is imprinted on your retina or upon your imagination. <laughs> Arthur, I think it's getting chilly in here. Would you like the fire? 
It's so late. It's ready to go. Uh, Louise, it, it, it was a marvelous dinner. <laughs> it is an often I can combine a professional visit with such pleasure. <laughs> Where will you look at that? <laughs> One match. <laughs> Arthur, I've been thinking about our conversation over coffee, and I cannot really see between your, your nightmares and reality. Seeing them night after night? Not a symbol of some kind? <laughs> it could have, have a far more prosaic meaning than a psychic warning. I know just what you're going to say. Strain. Overwork. It's one of the weapons I used to use in my story. My thinking exactly. When I was a physician, I would tell my patients the same thing. Overwork. You need to rest. It will pass, etc. Arthur, because you practice medicine doesn't mean you don't suffer the same ailments from the same causes. Anyway, the dreams are a problem of the past. It's the visions I get at present I'd like to explain. Take a glass, Arthur, and come up to my study. Will you excuse us, dear? Well, I, I say this. Nobody has the time or the patience or the talent to make a mirror like this today. All that finely wrought silver, the artisans who made this have been as long since dead. I, I congratulate you, Arthur. Come in. Where did you find it? My publisher, Peter Matson and I were in Thieves' Market, and we were both quite taken with it. First thing I knew, Peter had bought it and gave it to me as a present. Mm. What do you make of it? Well, it's a, yeah, push your desk lamp a little closer to the mirror. Mm. We'll turn it over and have a look. It <laughs> mm. oh, is an interesting inscription. But you don't happen to have a magnifying glass. Yes, right here. Oh, good. Uh, let me have a pencil and a sheet of paper. I, I, I will make a sketch of this inscription. And help yourself. Hmm. You know, I have a patient who makes a hobby of heraldry. You, he may give us a tip. There's peculiar marking, the way those letters are twisted together, and that head is a dog or a cat or a lion. Hmm. George. I asked you up here not so much to have a look at the back of the mirror as at the front. Uh, yes, yes, uh, just a moment. I, I, I'll have it. It's all drawn in a moment. There's a snake-like mark. There. Now, would you turn the mirror around so it faces you? Pop it up against those two big dictionaries on the table. Mm -hmm. You can leave the lamp where it is. Well, now what? May you stay seated in my chair. I'll stand behind you, and we'll both look straight into the mirror. Uh, 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 Arthur, is uh, this what you do when you're alone? <laughs> Gaze into the mirror? I'll tell you what I do. I'm sitting where you are, writing, concentrating on the words on the page. And all of a sudden, I get an impression of movement, as though I see something fluttering or waving out of the corner of my eye. Oh, yes, peripheral vision. Uh. If I look up quickly, there's nothing. But if I very slowly raise my head, there is something moving in that mirror. Yes, I'm looking. But keep on. Be patient. Uh, do you see anything? Not yet. Uh, uh, perhaps we shouldn't be talking. Huh? I don't know why that would have anything to do with it. Unless sound vibrations disturb... Ah, like a... Telephone ringing to another world, George. That's brilliant. <laughs> a telephone to another world. I'm going to use that line someday. Yeah, what you see in the mirror, Arthur, is it just movement, like a, like a passing shadow? So far, yes. But each time, the impression is stronger. I, or do you mean more definite? You see recognizable objects? Not exactly. I've seen shadows in the shape of a cross or a dagger. But this morning, I was alone in here, and I was sure there were two separate, distinctly separate things. Uh, well, uh, can you well, describe them better than that? I can't describe them at all. That's why I call them things. They could be curtains or people. But I do get the impression there is a life going on inside that mirror. Uh, uh, frankly, uh, frankly, I don't think we're going to see anything this evening. <laughs> it's very strange. 
This is the first time the mirror has failed me. I came as quickly as I could. I'm so worried, George. He's lying there in his study in a dead faint. Oh, I can't bring him to. I, I, I didn't dare move. Well, I have some smelling salts in my bag. Yes, yes here we are. Well, this ought to bring him around. <coughs> Arthur, and now for wake up. Arthur. What is it? What is it? George, what are you doing here? Why am I lying on the floor? Oh, my darling, you had me so worried. What am I doing in these clothes? Didn't I go to bed last night? Oh, George, help me up. Oh, yes, yes, yes. And now you're going no farther than this chair by your work table. Now, it's, it's still. Sit still. I want to listen to your heart. Arthur, last night after George left, I was so tired I went straight up to bed. And it wasn't until this morning when I came down and found you here on the floor. Oh, George, is he all right? Is he going to be all right? I spent the night here. On the floor? Don't talk. Oh, take a deep breath. That's right. Now, let it out slowly. Ah, uh, <laughs> Louise, <laughs> Arthur's perfectly all right. <laughs> I could use some coffee. Coffee? Yes, so could I. Coffee? Are you sure? Of course I'm sure. Well, I I'll have some made and bring it to you. Oh, well, what is it you want to tell me, Arthur? How do you know I want to tell you something? Well, you'll never drink coffee in the morning. And it takes far longer to make coffee than tea. <laughs> you wanted Louise out of the room. <laughs> you are getting as discerning as my friend Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> Last night, about an hour after you left, I was writing at this table. I looked up and I saw actual human figures. In the silver mirror. Yes, well, were they familiar to you? Recognizable as in a dream? Not at all. I'd say they were from a previous era. 16th, 17th century, by the way they were dressed. Uh, you say they? Well, how many? The young man and the young woman. He had a little beard and a mustache. Italian looking. He was playing a guitar. He put it down. And he stood in front of this young woman. She was beautifully dressed, certainly nobility, but the most distinctive thing about her was her red hair. She wore it tumbled down to her shoulders, as if she had just taken the pins out and was getting ready for bed. But, uh, did they say something? Or did you hear them speak? Not a word. They just looked at one another, and that was all. Uh, 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 what was all? All I remember. That's well, I must have fainted. Yes, well, Arthur, evidently, these visions, or whatever you see in the mirror, only appear to you at night. I'm going to have the pharmacist make up a prescription for you. Now, before you go to bed, take two of the tablets. Uh, you'll have a good night's sleep. You think I'm hallucinating, don't you? Before I had the mirror, I had bad nights, nightmares. I saw daggers. Louise thought the same thing. And now you do. Yes, but, but a great many people are deeply affected by visions they don't understand. And I'm not taking the chance that Arthur Conan Doyle will end up on a slab in the morgue having died of shock. He won't. I assure you. As I know he won't because I'm going to watch him like a hawk. Here's your coffee, you two. Ah, Louise. Oh, Louise, bless you. <laughs> I'm going to ask you a favor. Arthur and I have had a long talk, and we agree. The most important thing is to see to it. He gets a good night's rest every night. Arthur, where are you going? I'm going up to my study to write. I always do after dinner. Well, I shall come up for you at 11, and then it's bedtime for you. Louise, I can't work to the clock. Suppose I'm in the middle of something I'm writing. I can't turn it off like a water tap and then turn it on again tomorrow. I am coming at 11 o'clock into your study, and if you're not finished, I will sit there and wait for you. Arthur, I am going to make sure you take the sleeping tablets George prescribed. I'll take them. I'll take them. I never said I wouldn't. All right, Arthur. Just so long as that's understood. What are you doing? Can't you see? Look behind you. Arthur, 
What's going on in there? I'm not seeing this. I'm not. Arthur, what's the matter? What? Arthur, do you hear me? Uh, is that you, Louise? But I heard you crying out. Is something wrong? Nothing's wrong. Everything's fine. Now, leave me alone. It's not 11 o'clock yet. Are you sure you're all right? Let me just come in for a minute. Why have you locked yourself in? Louise, you're behaving like a spoiled child. I need to be alone while I'm writing. You know that. Now, go away. At 11 o'clock, I'll unlock the door. Mirror, silver mirror, show me your secret one more time. Marry my queen. Protect me. The king wants me dead. I have done nothing to harm him. Nothing. My dear master of music, no one will harm you. My queen, they think that your love of music has turned into a love of myself. I am still Mary of Scots. My word is law. Oh, I hear them. They have knives. Oh, on my knees, senor, I thank you. Hey, Mr. what are you doing in my wife's chamber? David came to sing me the songs of Italy. Oh, what is a sing to you? No whispers. No secret words. Yes, he whispered to me, darling, that you planned to murder him. But there are men in the passageway. Is that true, husband? I know nothing about it. Then she's your dagger. We were going to kill the poor little Italian. What have I seen? What murder is it? Or was it? There's nothing in the mirror now but my own face. If I call upon the mirror again... Oh, I can't. I can't watch a murder... Louise, Louise, come in here. I've got to unlock the door. Louise, where are you? I'm here, Arthur. It's all right, dear. I have just seen the impossible. A man about to be murdered. A woman trying to protect him. She is a queen. A queen. And then murderers coming at this little man with daggers in their hands. I swear to you, Louise, I am perfectly sane. And I have seen that happen in that mirror. How much of Conan Doyle's peak at the past, strangely transmitted through the silver mirror, was self-induced hypnosis, and how much was actual, we shall never know. For we only have the entries in his diaries and mention in accounts of his personal adventures. What we do know is that Doyle was so troubled by these recurring visions that he took the one step few men dare to take when their own sanity is at stake. I shall return shortly with Act Three. a man admired the world over for turning a short story into a modern art form, for creating an unforgettable master of detection and whose ingenious methods of solving crimes actually furthered the science of criminology. Yet that same man of impeccable logic is unable to find an explanation for scenes that appear to him through the glass of an antique silver mirror. George, how is your patient today? Uh, Louise, uh, you have to realize that in matters that concern the mind, progress isn't measured by the day. The biggest leap towards his recovery that Arthur has made, to my way of thinking, was to knock on the door of my rest home and say, let me in, George, I need professional and medical help. But do you really think that being out here, away from his study and work and... All the pressures of all those letters we're getting. Well, particularly that, yes, yes. I, I, I'll be frank, my dear. The science of the mind is a relatively new field to all of us. But it could very well be that all the letters and new stories begging Arthur to revive his Sherlock Holmes series, it, it could be contributing to his mental problems. The mind has a peculiar way of dealing with guilt. Guilt? Do you think he realizes that? Well, well, I certainly hope so. Our success with him may depend on it. May I see him? Uh, no, no, not yet. Let it wait a few days. Guilty. Is 
that what you think is at the root of all this? Uh, well, I haven't decided, Arthur. Well, how can I? What we're both trying to find out is why you see things that you do in the, the silver mirror. I'll tell you why, George. I have a simple explanation. Nothing to do with feeling guilty because I killed off Sherlock Holmes. I see what is in the mirror because it's really there. Uh, well, uh, it's, it's possibly, but uh, why does no one else see anything? Uh, and why that mirror? Oh, uh, which reminds me. I got an answer from that friend of mine, the, the heraldic buff. Uh, I've uh, looked into it, but I think it would mean a lot more to you, so... Here it is. Thanks, I'll read it. Yes, well, <clears throat> I'll be back out here in the morning and we'll uh, talk a bit more, all right? One question before you go. Uh, when can I see Louise? Oh, well, uh, shall we say <laughs> the day after tomorrow. And any other visitors? Peter Matson, my publisher, has left messages here several times. Oh, well, uh, you can see him at any time. I'm only postponing Louise because he's so uh, emotionally involved. Uh, but Matson is by all means. You know, this place isn't a jail. Uh, you came here voluntarily to try to put your mental house in order, and if friends will help, well, then, by all means, see them. I come down here to the beach every day, Peter. I walk, and I think. And, uh, Dr. Sinclair, is he helping? Oh, George... He's as puzzled as I am. He's got a theory that I see things in that mirror you gave me because I feel guilty about not writing any more home stories. Are you talking about the mirror that we found at Thieves' Market? Mm -hmm. uh, you see something in there? Pictures. Actual pictures. Things, scenes I've never seen before. Huh. Uh, like a stereopter? No. The people move. More like the kinetoscope that American Edison invented. I actually saw an attempted murder. But I don't know who the people are. One's Italian. His name is David. And there's a young woman with red hair whose name is Mary. And people call her Your Majesty. Why do you look at me like that, Peter? Arthur, I believe you. I do. These scenes you see... It took place a long time ago, is that it? That reminds me. A friend of George's had some idea about how old the mirror was. I got the letter in my room. I haven't looked at it yet. Uh, look, do, do you think there's the slightest possibility your own mind could be playing tricks because of this old uh, Sherlock Holmes business? Oh, who knows? What I do know is I've spent three months trying to outline two novels, ending up throwing two reams of paper into the wastebasket. Ah, I have an idea. Why don't you try your hand at just one simple short story? Nothing wrong, no no novelette, no novel. Bring Holmes back or don't bring him back. Write one short story. If it works, maybe you'll want to do another. I can't write here. So leave. Walk out. Or write at home as you used to. I can't write at home. Ah, Louise, uh, the worried wife. Well, well, then come to my place. I won't tell anyone where you are. You can have a room all to yourself. Fireplace, bath, but no one to disturb you. Just to walk out of here? What's the alternative? Will you walk on this beach and you brood and you talk to the seagulls. Inactivity is not for you, Arthur. You've got to work. Think about it. I don't have to. I think you've solved my problem. Work. Now, um, tell me, what's all this? about the silver mirror. Peter, I want you to see it in action for yourself. I'll get myself over to your house. You go over to my house. The back door is usually open. Tomorrow morning, go up to my study and bring the mirror to your place. If we can solve what's going on inside that thing, who knows? I might come up with a very saleable plot. Uh, no, no, he's not at the rest home. Is he at home with you? 
No. Father's not here. I was coming to Devon today to see him. No, no, he is not here. We've searched the crowd and he's nowhere to be found. He, he just took his case of clothes and walked out. Oh, well, I'm sorry, George. If he comes in, shall I tell him to call you? Well, if he comes home, you make sure he remains there. He shouldn't be running around loose. I gave him a relaxing drug. He might suffer all kinds of delusions. Arthur? Peter, is that you? Uh, I've got it. I've got the mirror. Oh, careful with it. I don't want it broken. Oh, you shined it up. This was some bargain. Now, uh, what's the history of this fancy piece of glass? Uh, you had a letter from a friend of your doctor's? On the back of the mirror, according to what he writes, do you see that letter M and the face of a lion? Hmm. That's the Lion of Scotland. And the entwining is very similar to a signet ring belonging to Mary, Queen of Scots. I, that would make this over 300 years old. Then, the man says, look at the design of the frame itself. Identical with that on a silver casket made for Queen Mary. Possibly made by the same silversmith. <laughs> they surely did get a bargain. Yes. Um, have you been, uh, thinking about how to revive Sherlock? I've had a few thoughts. Uh, so have I. Uh, I was thinking uh, there could have been uh, footholds in that sheer cliff, and Holmes, instead of leaping to his death in the chasm, could have climbed out and laid low. Oh, Arthur, I guarantee if you can bring Holmes back, you make thousands of readers very happy. And yourself... You're convinced it will give me peace of mind, aren't you? I most certainly do. Hmm. Can't you just see it? The return of Sherlock Holmes. Huh. Well, now, I, I must be off to the office. There's plenty of paper, sharp pens, black ink. I moved my head to look at the cabinet behind me, and when I turned, there was Sherlock Holmes, smiling at me across my study table. I rose to my feet in utter amazement, and then fainted for the first time and last time in my life. Your husband, madam, apparently. What are you doing with that dagger? It is. I recognize her now from her portraits. It's Mary, Queen of Scots, and Darnley, the king. So this is how the murder of the little Italian musician actually happened. My queen, that musician secretary of yours, David Riccio, have him come forth from your sleeping chamber. He's not there. He has been there over long. He is here at our royal wish. Husband, have you taken leave of your senses? Which you has offended against the Queen's honor. Who are those outside behind you? Charitable friends. They have only your best interest at heart. Charitable friends? You mean jealous enemies because David pleases me. Come up over there. Come up from behind the Queen's Help gun. me. Help me. Save me. Save me. What is it? Why are you sitting here in the dark? The cook says you haven't eaten anything all day. Here, here let me light this lamp. Ah. Oh, that's better. Uh, may I sit down? Arthur, you don't look well. You're white as a ghost. I have seen ghosts, Peter. Enough ghosts. To fill a graveyard over and over, murder and death. In your mind's eye? In the silver mirror. It was more than anyone could bear. How cruel our ancestors were. Ah. Is that why you turned the mirror face down? Don't ask me why I have been chosen to have the privilege of seeing the reenacted past. 
But I have. And I don't have 300 years to forget it. Do you believe me? Yes. Yes, I do believe you. I only wish there was some way that I could share this with you. David Riccio. Remember your history? The Savoyard who played the guitar for the Queen and sang her melancholy songs. I saw him murdered by Darnley and Douglas and Scott. I saw the pitiful little Italian dragged kicking and screaming to the head of the stairs of the Holyrood Palace. I saw him savagely stabbed 50, 60 times and then thrown down the stairs. And then... As soon as the murder was done, it all began again. The wretched mirror repeating the entire tragedy. I couldn't bear to look anymore. And I didn't dare to break the mirror either. Break the mirror? Oh, I'm glad you didn't. And now that you tell me what you saw, it all fits together. Much of English history is in ruins today. But in Mary's Palace in Holyrood... The very room where David Riccio met his death, there is a contemporary engraving. At the top of the stairs down which Riccio's murdered body was thrown is in the picture. The door that faced the hall through which the murderers entered, and a back wall that faces the room, the door, the hall, and the stairs. Now, on that wall is a mirror, a silver mirror. Could it have been this one? It's not impossible. Oh, Peter, do you know what this means to me? I wasn't imagining. I wasn't dreaming. I was merely in touch with events past, as imprinted upon this mirror as a photographic plate. Peter, I think I can fall to now. Everything is clear. I'd like to begin by writing a few adventures about the return of Sherlock Holmes. <laughs> glad to hear it. I'm also glad to welcome the return of Arthur Conan Doyle. Conan Doyle did revive his immortal character and wrote another 13 Sherlock Holmes stories, including the famous... Hound of the Baskervilles. Which story contains that unforgettable exchange demonstrating Holmes' unique powers and deduction? Watson, is there a point to which you wish to draw my attention? Holmes, the curious incident of the dog in the night. Watson, the dog did nothing in the night time. Holmes, that was the curious incident. I shall return shortly. This <laughs> cult, call it the expression of a need. Since the death of Conan Doyle some 50 years ago, the fame and name of his principal protagonist lives as if it had sprung alive from the printed page. There are groups the world over, clubs such as the Speckled Band, made up of devotees to detective fiction. And, we are proud to announce, there are members of the Baker Street Irregulars who are fans and listeners to the Mystery Theater. After all, we're all the same family, aren't we? Our cast included Gordon Gould, Marion Seldes, Earl Hammond, and Ray Owens. The entire production was under the direction of Hyman Brown. Radio Mystery Theater was sponsored in part by Raven House Paperback Mysteries. This is E.G. Marshall, inviting you to return to our mystery theater for another adventure in the macabre. Until next time... Pleasant dreams.